The majority of Erased was almost universally praised. It was an incredibly interesting show with a neat concept, mystery, and a thrilling plot you couldn't stop watching. But near the end, it did something that for many people soured the experience, turning what could have potentially been a masterpiece into something disappointing, and for some, almost ruined the show. So what happened? You see, despite everything I talk about in this video, Erased is still 100% worth watching. In fact, you may even enjoy the ending. However, it still has a number of glaring flaws that need to be talked about, from rushed pacing to poor motivations, illogical writing decisions, and a final nail in the coffin that caused a lot of emotional investment to be wasted. This is how Erased ruined its ending. But to answer that, we have to question what made it good in the first place. And that starts with a simple but effective premise. The show begins with Satoru Fujinuma, a man with a mysterious ability he calls revival, an ability that makes it so that whenever something terrible happens, it throws him back in time and gives him a second chance to stop it from happening, which already is a super interesting idea with a ton of potential. Now back in 1988, something terrible happened where three kids in Satoru's area were mysteriously kidnapped and killed. One of them was Satoru's classmate, a little girl named Kair. Because of this, Satoru felt immense guilt over not doing anything when he still had the chance, wishing that he could have somehow done something to save her. Skip forward to the present. and Satoru's mom is suddenly killed by the same murderer. This causes Satoru's ability to activate, throwing him back to 1988, right before the murders took place, giving him a second chance to stop the incident from happening, save the people he cares about, and rewrite history in the process. And that's exactly what he does. Now, a big reason why Erased worked so well is because of how well executed it is in a lot of areas. It was tightly written, it had solid tension and mystery, and most importantly, knew exactly how to break things down on a human level and make me care. Erased is also a great example of why stakes don't always need to be huge in order to be interesting. If anything, having grand scale world ending conflicts can actually get kind of boring at times. <coughs> Marvel. But what Erased understands is that having smaller but more personal stakes is incomparably more interesting because that's what we as humans humans connect to the most. It gets only a few characters, makes us care about them, and then puts their life at risk. And it doesn't just tell us something bad's gonna happen, it flat out shows us. If we fail, Satoru's mom is dead, Kaio is dead. This is a certainty unless Satoru does something to stop it. And this creates tension. Knowing exactly what the outcome is going to be means we have something to fear that we want to do everything in our power to stop. Which leads us to the how. How do we stop the bad thing from happening? Because of this one aspect, we are now on the edge of our seats as we watch the show unravel. They find information and plan to do one thing, but as they're doing it, something suddenly changes and now we've got to do something else and wait to see if that works. This means that the show has us super invested in what's going on, and even during the more relaxing and character focused scenes, we're still extremely interested because we're constantly anticipating what's going to happen next. Now this is all well and good, but none of this stuff in regards to stakes would really work if we didn't care about the characters in the first place. Which brings us to the real heart of the story, or even what I might argue is the most important part of Erased, and that's Kaio. While we see everything through Satoru's perspective, I believe that what Erased was always really about is Kaio. Not long after Revival kicks in and Satoru goes back, saving Kaio basically becomes the main focus of the show. The simple but effective decision to have Kaio as the main focus not only ties back into what I said before about tension, but also allows us to really get to know her and create a lot of emotional substance. This is a child who was constantly beaten, neglected, and yelled at by her abusive mother. A child who, because of this upbringing, developed a somewhat cold personality, and in turn was isolated from the rest of her classmates. A child who's had basically nothing her entire life and wants desperately to escape and go somewhere else where nobody will ever find her, and yet still meets her untimely end at the hands of a serial killer. But now, Satoru has a chance to change things. This time, Satoru goes out of his way to talk to Kaio and get to know her. It's incredibly sweet and heartwarming because this time Satoru is able to give Kaio so many of the things she never had, the beautiful parts of life that she never got to experience before. Genuine friends that care about her, birthday parties, having fun exploring places she's never seen, being part of a real family. And all this leads into the most heartbreakingly beautiful scene in the entire show, where Kaio wakes up and Satoru's mom had made her a nice breakfast, and Kaio is speechless. She remembers how her own mother would just leave her cup noodles, which over time just became bread, which then became a few coins to buy it herself. And seeing the homemade meal Satoru's mom made for her, she begins to cry. This is what I believe Erased was really all about. Not just saving Kaio, but giving her what she really needed all this time. 
It's such a simple yet powerful scene and is the perfect example of what I loved about Arrays so much. After this, we move on to the next scene where we finally confront Kaio's mom. It's really tense and exciting and it ends the episode on a high note. This is, in my opinion, where Arrays hit its peak. But unfortunately, everything from here on out goes on a slow, gradual decline. Now before I get into the nitty gritty of how this all happens, there are actually quite a few things that people commonly criticize about the last few episodes that I actually didn't mind. One complaint is that Revival, Satoru's time travel ability is never fully explained as to why he has it. And while I somewhat understand, I honestly feel like it wasn't really the point of Erased in the first place, and sometimes over explaining things that never needed to be explained can actually be a detriment. Could you imagine if they had tried having a logical explanation for why Bill Murray was experiencing Groundhog Day? It'd ruin the movie. Sometimes a story just has a main idea behind it and you just need accept that's how the universe in this story works. So long as it's properly established at the beginning, and the rules are clearly set, and it doesn't contradict itself for no good reason, then it's honestly fine to just have it stay as a story element that's never fully explained. The other criticism is that the identity of the killer is like, really obvious. And I agree, pretty much anyone who's looking for it would be able to figure it out really quickly, especially considering he looks almost exactly the same and there's literally no one else who also looks like him. But this isn't a detective show and again, it's really not the point of a raise in the first place. Heck, trying to find out who the killer is is barely even on the forefront of Satoru's mind. I'm perfectly content with a predictable villain so long as they remain as an actual threat and are well written, which is... Uh, I'll, I'll get to that later, but I honestly think a race could still easily be amazing even with a predictable villain. And the last thing I want to bring up is a major plot hole in regards to Satoru himself that I actually somewhat agree with. You see, in the beginning, it's established that he's afraid, afraid to dig down into the heart of his own mind. What doesn't make sense about this is that he spends the rest of the show learning to do this when all he really needed in his life was Raid Shadow Legends. Mom? Uh, is that you? It's been years, what are you doing here? Rage Shadow Legends is a free mobile game that brings a true console level experience to your phone. Mom? Gaming will never be the same again thanks to Rage Shadow Legends. Mom, what, what are you saying? Whatever do you mean, Satoru? I'm only talking about how the game has over 600 champions with unique skills and hundreds of artifacts. You know, Satoru, you can build your team and develop your champions your way. Mom, you're scaring me! Oh, don't be like that. For eight Shadow Legends have not only established themselves as the leading mobile and PC game, but also keep adding new content and game modes every few months. No. Oh no, my dear. Are you okay? You look sick. Uh, oh, it's okay. Uh, I, I know just the thing that'll cheer you up. A comprehensive tour of the amazing things that happened with the game's last three years. No! First, there's the Dome Tower, a game mode introducing a whole new world of new and terrifying bosses to slay, sprawling over 120 levels, bringing exciting new challenges for seasoned players. But I'm not a seasoned player. Oh, oh, right. Um, but that's okay, for as a high level, high collection RPG, they not only have hundreds of unique characters and bosses, but they keep adding in more and more champions. The game designers must have had a field day creating these amazing characters. Just check out these sketches, they're so badass. Mom? Yes? Please, please don't say badass ever again. And if adding new characters wasn't enough, you're really just gonna ignore Raid it. Raid added a whole new faction. The evil Shadowkin are a tribe of warriors from the Far East, recently liberated from the reign of evil. But that doesn't mean they're the good guys either. For me, they're just one of the coolest looking factions in the game. I, look, Mom, I, I really don't wanna play this game. And of course, there's a Hydra Clan boss. Wait, there's a Hydra Clan boss? Yeah, I said, no way. That is without a doubt the biggest, baddest, and scariest boss to ever set foot in Teleria. Let me try. Uh, okay. Amazing! This monster has multiple heads, each with a different ability and requires a different strategy to destroy. But the challenging part is that even if you manage to chop off one of the heads, another one grows to replace it, which can be quite discouraging when you beat it, but it, it gives some of the best artifacts in the game, which is super satisfying. I, yes, I, you know, I could go on and on about Raid Shadow Legends. It really is the perfect game for all player types. You can take it easy and play casually, but you can also dive in for hours and have an amazing time. Mom! Hey, yes? Tell me more about this wonderful game! Well, I can also tell you about this amazing trick-or-treat promotion, Halloween, where you can win a bunch of real-life and in-game prizes. For example, some of the best epic and legendary Halloween champions in Raid and $1,000 Amazon gift cards. I like money, tell me more. You see, it's all free and super easy. All you need to do is get a Raid player ID after downloading Raid with the link in the description and heading to trickortreat.playroom.com, which is also linked in the description, enter your details, spin the wheel, and receive your prize. 
only new players can receive a prize. And you better be quick because it only runs from October 15th to November 5th and once it's over, it's over. It seems as if there's never been a better time to get started. That's right. Simply click the link in the description or scan the QR code here on the screen. So easy. Yes, it's that easy. And if you do, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. I'm talking a free epic champion, Virgis, 200k silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in the game. So all that amazing treasure will be waiting for me there? Amazing, I'm gonna get it right now. Thanks, mom. Yes, just click the link in the description and I'll see you in the game. Mom? Ah! 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 I don't know anymore. Part two, the gradual decline. The beginning of episode nine represents the first point where the cracks and arrays started to show. The episode begins right where the previous episode left off, where we finally confront Kyo's mom. Keep in mind, before this, we see Kyo's mom basically go on a full on rampage, destroying stuff in a blind rage, and only stops when she hears the doorbell ring and she knows that Kyo's back. The scene basically goes as you'd expect it to at first. Kyo's mom is very angry, Satoru calls her out for being a bad parent, the people come to take Kyo into custody as planned, Kyo's mom resists and tries to get the police involved, and then this happens. Kyra's grandma shows up. Then we get a flashback for a few seconds telling us that Kyra's mum was also abused at some point, and then she collapses to the floor crying, heartwarming music plays, and the show now expects us to feel sorry for her. <sighs> okay. I'm not here to downplay the emotional trauma that abuse victims go through since this is a very real thing that many people in real life actually go through. People who are abusive tend to also have been abused and the show was obviously trying to portray that. My issue with the scene isn't the subject matter or the content in itself. My issue is that the show went about presenting this in a really weird way. Before this, the show really, really wants us to hate the mom. In almost every scene prior to this, it constantly emphasizes, almost cartoonishly at times, that she is a vile and despicable human being who only cares about herself. Someone who, when she realizes that her own daughter is dead, her only reaction is to be scared the police will find out, who will then go on to smile evilly, throwing out that same dead daughter's belongings and show zero remorse throughout the entire show for all the physical and emotional abuse she puts Kyra through. So why would they go through all the effort to do this? only to suddenly bank an entire scene on us feeling sympathy towards her in order for it to work. Backstory or not, the show hasn't done anything before this point to actually earn this moment. It just gives us the token, but she was abused too backstory and thinks that's enough to change my entire perception of her. And I know this is what the show was trying to do because while the mum is loudly crying, other characters are also tearing up, signifying to us that it's supposed to be a touching moment, all while gentle piano music is playing. And the cherry on top is that Sazaru's mum goes up to her and suggests that even she must have cared about her daughter at some point, which is an almost unintentionally laughable line of dialogue because not once does it ever show even the tiniest hint of that throughout the entire show. Doing an emotional scene with a backstory worked with Kyra because we already felt sympathetic towards her from the start. All it needed to do was put focus on a specific part of her life that we never really considered before, but that doesn't apply here. Not to mention, the backstory itself is also extremely overly simplistic with how it portrays the subject matter, almost as if it doesn't quite have a full understanding of how abuse victims can become abusive in the first place. Like it shows the mom getting hit. Then it goes to later when she's all hurt and bandaged up, she holds Kaya's cheek, then turns away, is completely calm, and then for seemingly no reason suddenly turns around again and starts beating her? Like, forgive me if I'm wrong on this, but I'm quite sure there's a bit more to it than that. It speeds through everything that happens so quickly that none of it feels believable. If this wasn't a flashback and was just shown in real time, it'd seem ridiculous. Such a drastic character change like this, one going from caring to abusive, is the sort of thing that needs to happen gradually over time. But instead, this all happens in about 20 seconds, and completely uprooting how we've been seeing a character for the last 8 episodes and making us change our mind on them isn't exactly something that can easily be done within a 20 second Demon Slayer-esque flashback. Like, imagine if it took just a little bit more time to show how this level of abuse affected the mom throughout the years, and how she'd slowly become more and more abusive and neglectful over time. Maybe Kyra would say something she didn't like or doesn't listen, and she'd hit her in response, which slowly became more and more frequent. This would add so much to this flashback, because we all had our moments where we get angry or yell at someone, and it makes us realize that any of us has the potential to become this person if pushed hard enough. It wouldn't have required too much more time, but it could have been written in a way with more subtlety and nuance behind it, rather than just doing it in the most predictable and obvious way you could possibly think of. Now, I know I've been rambling on about this for an unnecessary amount of time, and honestly, it really isn't that bad in the first place, especially when compared to some of the stuff that happens later, but the reason I'm nitpicking this so much is because I truly believe that if this scene was just executed a little bit differently, it could have potentially been one of the greatest scenes in the entire show. 
How? Well, I'm saving how I'd personally do this until the end of the video, but until then, I believe the perfect example of how to do this is Konosuba. Okay, but for real though, originally I had an entire section here talking about Azula from Avatar The Last Airbender, but realized this video is long enough as it is, and since Hello Future Me already did an entire video on it, I might as well just point towards that instead. I'll also be putting the full script on Patreon for anyone who's interested. But the main takeaway here is how while both are characters who suffered abuse and abused others, one earned this moment through layers and layers of build-up and character development, and the other was done on a whim. That's the difference. Okay, let's finally move on. After the confrontation, Kaio says goodbye to Satoru and drives away with her grandma. And honestly, the scene is really good. With Kaio narrating the poem again from the beginning and also adding a whole new layer of meaning to it and the title of the show as they drive away and Satoru chases after her as they see each other again for the last time, adding a layer of bittersweetness to it all. It's a beautiful scene. Although I'd like it much better if it actually happened during the last episode in the show, but I digress. They drive away, it's really bittersweet, but then after a few seconds of Satoru standing in the snow, we start to realize something. Oh, um, what are we supposed to do now? The episode is just beginning and Kaio, aka the main reason we're even here right now, is gone and all the investment I had in the plot left with her. The show puts so much emphasis on her that by the time she leaves and we now have two other random kids that we need to save, both of which we don't really know or care that much about, it just feels more like a chore than anything. I'm gonna be honest, I think the writer kind of wrote themselves into a bit of a wall with this part. It's possible they were planning for the two other kids to have their own arc similar to Kaio's after hers was complete, but realized that would be a major drag to go through. I think the writer was well aware at this point that nobody really cared that much about the two other kids. Heck, I don't even think they themselves did either since we barely learn anything about them. But we still had to resolve it regardless, so they just tried to get it over with as quickly as they realistically could. I'm not going to linger too much on this since the solution is fairly obvious. Either you don't establish them at the beginning in the first place or you find a way to intertwine their stories organically with Kairos. But again, I think the writer was well aware of that, but it was too late to go back and change things and had to make do with what they had. But I want to make things clear that despite all my complaints, at this point, a raise still wasn't bad. It was sort of underwhelming and was a lot less interesting after Cairo left, sure, but it was still 100% redeemable and could easily get back on his feet again until it made a certain decision. Now, Satoru at this point has successfully saved Kaio, Hiromi, and the other girl. Neither of them are alone now and won't be targeted anymore. And Satoru, believing that Misato was the next target, tried to follow her and is now sitting in the car with his teacher, Yashiro Gaku. Gaku? Goku! Now what's important to establish here is that while the main A plot with Kaio is finished, there are still a bunch of unresolved side plots in regards to many of the side characters. A lot of smaller things being built up that seem to be leading somewhere. But then the reveal happens and it turns out that... Oh! <gasps> Goku is the murderer. He reveals everything to Satoru after he realized it was him who was foiling all his plans. And so he locks Satoru in the car, who is for some reason unable to score him out of the seatbelt like most children are capable of doing, and he leaves a basketball to drive the car into a lake, leaving Satoru for dead. Satoru screams that he knows Yashiro's future, everything fades to black, and the next episode skips forward to 15 years in the future. Uh, Every single problem in a race from here on out can be traced back to this one decision. A time skip. Satoru was in a coma for the entirety of his childhood, has only just woken up now, and he has missed everything. Now I know that a time skip may not sound that bad on its own, but if I had to point to the one thing that ruined the ending of a race the most, it'd be this. Because not only did it come with its own set of problems, but it also directly caused almost every other problem I have with this ending. And in just one moment, I knew the show was getting everything that it spent so long getting me to care about, and was about about to throw it into the dumpster. You'll notice this will be a running theme in a race. This time skip did several things. The first is that it took almost all the momentum that was built up throughout the story and killed it. Let me explain. This is gonna be a bit technical though, so please bear with me for a little bit. I promise this will make sense. When a story begins, it obviously starts off with nothing. It's a blank state, the status quo. But as things start to happen, one thing causes another thing to happen, and then that thing causes another thing to happen. Everything that happens in a story builds upon what happened previously, and you won't be able to get to a certain point without the things that happened before it. This is what I mean by momentum, there's a cause and effect. Which means that as a story advances, the amount of momentum it has gets higher and higher. And when you reach the climax, this is where the momentum needs to be the highest. The climax is supposed to be the culmination of everything that has happened before it. It's what makes the entire story up until this point feel worthwhile because this was where it was all leading up to. And then when the story arc finishes, the momentum can then dip down again and we can establish the new status quo. Now, not every story absolutely has to adhere to this type of structure, but this was what Erased was doing until the last few episodes. Now, what a time skip does is that it resets the momentum down to zero again. 
This is because whenever a time skip happens, we're resetting the status quo and are basically starting again from the ground up. This is why generally the best times to do a time skip are either closer to the beginning or right at the end. This is why you usually see these in the forms of prologues and epilogues. This works at the beginning because we've only just gotten started anyway, so you're not really losing anything. And it works right at the end because the conflict has been resolved and we don't need the momentum anymore. We can just skip forward to how the characters' lives are like in the future as a satisfying bookend to finish things on. This principle also applies to television, but more so in the form of story arcs, where it looks more like this with the best times to do a time skip being during the downtime in between arcs. Take Attack on Titan for example. Or you could take Arcane, which did a time skip after its first act, but only after telling a completed story arc within its first three episodes. When you don't do any of this and decide to, say, do a time skip in the middle of the story, you're going to be at a point where we should be here and instead we're down here, trying to get back up there again. This is why we don't really get time skips in the middle of a story arc, since it can feel like an interruption, almost like we need to start all over. This is exactly the mistake that happened with Fan 4 Stick, which, well, we all know how that turned out. So with all this in mind, Erase decides to do its time skip about here. Are we seeing the problem? We're at the point where the momentum is supposed to be at its very highest, building up to the climax, the ultimate high point of everything the story has been leading up to thus far, and instead it resets us back to zero and now needs to establish a new status quo. And so Erased needs to do everything it can to get back up here again, and it can't. Meaning, as a result, the story just kind of fizzles out. Now, there are exceptions to this. The Promised Neverland Season 1, for example, technically also does a time skip at a similar point. No spoilers, but the reason this instance in particular works is because nothing significant actually changes before and after the skip. It only lasts about a month, the status quo hasn't changed, and the characters are still in the exact same situation they were in before. And the only reason this time skip even happens is so that the plot can keep up the momentum. Instead of spending several episodes showing the characters just waiting around and doing nothing for a month, which would be dreadfully boring and actually ruin the momentum, it gets to the point where things start moving again and the plot can continue from where it left off. It was technically a time skip, but didn't have the same function as one. So now, after this super long explanation, what exactly is my main point in all this? In Arrays, they should have resolved all the conflicts and beaten the bad guy before the time skip. Would this solve all the endings problems? Absolutely not, that's just the first problem, but at the very least it'd be a step in the right direction. The second problem with this time skip is, as said before, there were side characters whose stories were still unresolved. A lot of these plots seemed to be building up as if they were going to go somewhere, only to be cut short as soon as the time skip happened. Take Kenya for example. From very early on, there's this entire thing where he wants to be like a superhero in the same way that Satori was, which would lead you to believe that he would at least have one moment to properly pay that off. But he doesn't really, he just follows along with everything Satori is doing and never really gets much. Which is a shame, because I liked Kenya and thought his story was gonna go somewhere, but instead the time skip happens and now he's just... a lawyer. Yay. There's also this little moment between Satoru and Hiromi. Which seemed to hint towards something substantial happening in the future, but after knowing exactly what he actually does in the end, it's a bit contradictory to say the least. And then there's also Misuto, who definitely had something wrong going on with her that was building up ever since episode 3. It started with the lunch money incident, which led to her being slowly isolated from everyone else without Satoru even realizing it. Which is a really interesting side story that seemed to be leading somewhere, but in the end all she does is serve a small purpose in Goku's plan and is then tossed out the window. What was the point of all that mystery and build up if it was gonna go nowhere in the end? I was so sure that she was gonna play a big part in the last few episodes. Seriously, imagine how interesting it would have been if Masato ended up becoming the final target for the killer. That Satoru, while saving all these other kids, missed that he caused Misato to be isolated from everyone else, which ended up causing this. This would have been an amazing turn of events since it would make her entire arc have a real purpose in the larger story and it would show just how easily these types of mental issues can slip past us in plain sight. Saving Misato and exposing the killer should have been what the main conflict of the climax was. And I'm almost certain that that's what the writers had originally planned since they even hint towards exactly this with some of the dialogue but it seems like they changed their mind at the last second, and I really have no idea why. The bottom line here is that there were small but important story threads that still needed to be wrapped up, but were cut short as soon as this scene happened. In other words, it felt like we were leaving behind a story that wasn't ready to be left behind yet. As a result of this, when we move into the last few episodes after the coma, 
everything just feels hollow. And when we get to the entire confrontation with Yashiro again, it feels less like the climax of everything that came before, and more like we suddenly ended a story prematurely, started a new one, and then jumped straight to the climax for that story. And plus, it tried to introduce a new character and put their life at stake right at the end, but because we only just met her, it really doesn't have the same level of emotional stakes, or at least nowhere near as much as it would have been if it were a character we knew from the start, like Kaio or Misato. And those are just the inherent problems with the time skip itself but almost everything else that happened after the time skip also had a lot of issues, namely the villain. Yashiro Gaku, also known as the stupidest man on earth. How this man managed to get away with murder time and time again is beyond me, because the amount of insane luck he would have needed to pull off some of this stuff would have required divine intervention. While you're watching these plans unfold, it's framed as if it's super smart, and we believe it because of the mood and atmosphere and it seems to make sense at first, but then you think about it for like two seconds and you realize... This is really dumb. There is no way that any of these plans should have worked, and yet by some miracle they do. A miracle called plot convenience! Like, even if we just go back to the first episode where Satoru's mom is killed and Satoru is framed for the murder, let's just look at things from Yashiro's point of view. Ah uh, yes, this woman has most definitely figured out my identity. She's had pretty much all day to tell literally anyone, or write it down somewhere, but I'll just have to hope that she hasn't. Now I'm going to go to their home wearing my normal everyday clothes, kill her right before Satoru comes home, and hope that everyone thinks that he did it! And if all those things don't perfect line up. Well, I guess I'm screwed, lol. Satoru literally walks right past him, and all he does to hide it is just lower his hat a little. Which is framed as being super cool and mysterious, but what, what were you going to do on the off chance that he recognizes you? Like, at the very least, try to make it so he doesn't see you. Like, seriously, what would you have done in this far more likely situation where Satoru sees you? the only other person in the whereabouts, finds his mom dead, calls the police, and tells them everything that happened and about that suspicious man in a suit. This plan relied on a ridiculous amount of things going exactly the way he wanted them to, and if they don't, they fail. What if Satoru came home two minutes early? What would have happened if Satoru didn't just happen to have blood all over his hands while the neighbors were coincidentally standing at the entrance? Heck, if Satoru just calmed down and told the police officers everything he saw, I don't think they would have arrested him. They seem pretty understanding. It's not that unreasonable for him to say he just found the body. The only reason they even thought it was him was because he ran away. It was pure luck that Satoru panicked in the most suspicious looking way possible. And even if the police did suspect him, he doesn't have a motive. Why would he kill his mom? Because he just felt like it one day? If you're trying to frame him, at least provide some sort of clear reason as to why he'd do this. And say what you will about the police, but in most cases they still generally ask questions and learn more about the situation. And if they did exactly that with Satoru, they'd figure out pretty quickly that he wasn't the one who did it. If a villain is supposed to be perceived as smart and threatening, they actually need to have bulletproof plans that were clearly thought out. Otherwise I just see them as lucky, and poorly written, and they aren't a threat at all. Everything here just conveniently goes according to plan because that's what needs to happen in order for the plot to function. Now, Imagine this entire plan, but the stupidity factor was dialed up to 11. That's the ending! This time, they're both up on the rooftop, and my boy Yashiro Pistachio has a new plan. This time, he's trying to blackmail Satoru into telling him how he knew about the future, and he's going to do this by poisoning the IV drip for a little girl who's about to undergo surgery, leaving Satoru's fingerprints on it. And if Satoru doesn't talk, he'll push Satoru off the roof and let the girl die, and everyone will think Satoru did it, but felt guilty about it afterwards and decided to commit suicide. Yashiro, you absolute moron. You had 15 years to think of a good plan and this is all you could come up with? Why would this perfectly sane young man, who has been nothing but kind and friendly with this child, randomly decide to poison her, feel guilty about it afterwards, and proceed to jump off the roof? It doesn't make any sense. Are you forgetting he's frail? It'd be a bit difficult to sneak in and carefully go through the process of poisoning someone's IV drip while trying not to get caught if you can barely even walk. If I were a nurse who found out about the situation, I'd think it'd seem awfully suspicious that the person who poisoned this little girl for no reason conveniently also committed suicide right after. Hmm. Do most hospitals not have security cameras? You take two seconds to think about these plans and they immediately fall apart. How am I supposed to take this guy seriously? The show wants me to think he's this mysterious threatening murder dude, but he's unintentionally one of the dumbest villains I've seen in media. And that's not all, because if you think his plans are poorly thought out, his motivations are even worse. Because eventually the show comes to ask the question, why does Yashiro like to do murder in the first place? Is he a pedo? Is he perhaps a sadist who gains pleasure by watching other people suffering? Perhaps he's so motivated by hatred and simply wants to watch the world burn. No, the answer is not any of those things. The real reason why he's been doing all these murders in the first place is because of a Japanese short story.
Yep, I really don't know what was going on with this. Once upon a time, there was a sinner who was cast down to hell. But because he didn't kill a spider one time, Buddha liked that. So he gave the sinner a spider friend to climb out, but a bunch of other sinners also tried to climb out with him and then it stopped. And when I was a kid, I killed a bunch of hamsters, but one of them survived by standing on the body of another hamster, and ever since then, I also see spider friends above people's heads. And that's why I kill children. What? That, that doesn't explain anything, Sho. All you did was make things confusing. How does any of this explain anything? Heck, I would have been perfectly fine if they never explained his motivations. He's a killer! That's all I needed to know! But instead, they just had to be deep and complex and philosophical, and they just ended up overcomplicating things and it just made it worse. He just spouts nonsense that sounds like it has meaning, but it doesn't. It's just the show trying to sound smart without saying anything smart. I don't know, maybe I'm the stupid one, and I just don't get it. Maybe somewhere beneath all this, there's probably some kind of reasonable explanation for why he's doing this, but it's all tangled up in these deep sounding metaphors and symbolism that don't actually mean anything. When I introduced the entire story with the hamsters, I was so sure that it was going to go the direction of, oh, he started off with killing small animals and was fascinated by it, which naturally evolved into killing slightly larger animals and then people, which is an actual thing that happens with real serial killers and would explain why Yashiro was like this without portraying him as a victim but instead they just walked right past that opportunity. I feel like part of the reason I really loved the first eight episodes of Raised is that it felt somewhat grounded in reality. Yeah, there was the entire time travel thing which only really existed to get the premise rolling, but aside from that, a lot of these situations these characters went through could actually happen in real life. That made things feel a lot scarier because it's very possible there are kids out there who went through very similar situations that these kids did. Heck, even the scene with Kaya's mom, which I criticized before, at the very least still had this layer of credibility to it because I know the sort of thing actually happens. But this... Everything about this scene just feels ridiculous. They then tried to do this entire thing where it's like, oh, I actually secretly care about you now and I just can't live without you. And Satoru outsmarted him by figuring it out and all that and I just couldn't take it anymore at that point. It was such a weird way of going about things because I honestly couldn't even tell what the writers were trying to do anymore. Everything was just turning into a mess. Yashiro had apparently been waiting the entire 15 years out of curiosity after what Satoru said, but that curiosity slowly turned to love. And he shaved his beard when he was in bed and stuff, and now he can't kill Satoru because for some reason he can't live without him. And Satoru figured that out somehow, which is how he beat him, and it's this huge gotcha moment with the wink, and he landed on a giant inflatable pillow, and God, what even is this anymore? I can barely even critique this part because I can barely even understand what the writers were trying to go for. Were they trying to flesh out Yashiro? Were they trying to go for a more character-focused dramatic finale? Because that's not how it came across, both because the entire revelation felt like something the show pulled out of its butt, and because it doesn't make sense in the first place. You can't just make the villains care about the main character at a flick of a switch like that. I mean, villains can be fleshed out and care about other people, it's not exactly a new concept, but you need to do it carefully so it's believable. I honestly think it would have been fine if Yashiro was just an evil character. Not every villain has to be complex or fleshed out in order to be good. Sometimes they're just allowed to be simple. There's nothing wrong with that. So long as they serve their purpose in the story and the writer does a good job of making them a genuine threat, they can still be a great villain. But I think overcomplicating things that didn't need to be complicated was one of Array's biggest downfalls near the end. The show's strength was in its simplicity, but it tried to do too much without knowing how to do those things properly. I don't know, maybe this sort of thing is explained properly in the manga, but I'm not talking about the manga. I'm talking about the show. And the show should be able to stand on its own rather than telling people they have to read the source material in order to understand it. That's a failure on the show's part. All I can do is see things how they're presented to me and judge it based on that. Now, there is one more thing about this ending that really struck a nerve. The straw that broke the camel's back. The big thing that everybody talks about when they bring up this ending. For all of a race, the show develops a genuinely great relationship between Satoru and Kaio. They are incredibly adorable together and the show isn't subtle about it at all, but it's nice. They're constantly having cute little moments together and them growing closer is one of the most enjoyable parts of it. And then it pulls this. <sighs> she has a baby! And it's not Satoru's! That's right, they spent all this time pushing these two together only to suddenly go, You know what? Let's not do that anymore. Instead, let's put her with the trap she hasn't had a single conversation with and wiggle the child in everyone's face and make them suffer. So not only did the show go out of its way to throw the ship in the trash can for seemingly no reason, but it also pissed off its entire fan base while doing so. Spectacular move. Seriously, what exactly was the thought process behind this decision? What were they hoping to achieve? Did the writer wake up one day and decide, mm, yes, I'm feeling kind of sadistic today. Hey reader, you know that thing you're super emotionally invested in? I've decided to burn it. They even had the audacity to play uplifting music, as if it was supposed to be happy about this turn of events. And then, after everything's over, it goes, Oh look, you, you remember Irie? That one girl he had like, no chemistry with? There, he can have her instead. You're welcome. 
<laughs> Watching these last few episodes for the first time, I was so naive. I heard so much about the disappointment that it was, but I, being a fool, thought, oh surely they're just exaggerating. I'm sure it isn't that bad. It's probably just predictable or something and people thought it was gonna do something different. But I'm fine with that, so I'll be okay. And then the time skip happened. And I started getting kind of worried. But I stayed hopeful because I knew this sort of thing already happened before in the middle of the show and he used Revival to go back again. Yeah, this is supposed to be the bad timeline where everything's gone wrong and soon he's gonna go back and fix things and then we'll get the actual ending and it's super rushed and that's why everyone's complaining, but I'm fine with that, so I'll be okay. And then the baby showed up. Imagine discovering that your own killer was willing to wait, but your girl wasn't. But Brendan, can't you see? It's trying to show you that she's living a happy life now, and that has changed for the better. Yeah, okay, so out of the hundreds of different ways that you could show that she is happy, out of all the possible options they could have chosen, and they thought NTR was the right choice. If you wanted us to feel happy for her, then why would you do it in a way that makes us angry? It doesn't make sense. I was too distracted by the baby to even realize what the actual point of the scene was. And if a decision you make actively takes away from the point you were trying to make, then it's a bad decision. The show itself put in the effort to really emphasize how special this relationship was, building up a lot of people's emotional investment. Why would it do that if it wasn't planning to follow through with it? Either set things up and follow through, or don't set things up in the first place. One of the biggest defenses I keep seeing everywhere for this is that, oh, the show is just being realistic. You can't possibly expect her to wait 15 years. People move on. That's just life. But just because something is true to life and makes logical sense, it doesn't mean it's good. I could write a movie where the main character is just pointlessly suffering for two and a half hours and say the message is, that's life, but that doesn't make it well written. Like, imagine if in your name, after everything that happened, it just ended with, and then they never saw each other ever again. The end. Like, that'd be realistic, but it'd still make for a pretty crap conclusion. This is a fictional story. Of course, I don't actually blame Kyra herself for not waiting that long, but this isn't a documentary. The writer is in full control of everything that happens. I guarantee you, if Kyra walked in and she just happened to be single, nobody would be complaining that it's unrealistic. And it'd still get the point across just fine. This decision was not necessary to convey the themes of the show, and yet they went out of their way to do it anyways. This was intentional, and I can't for the life of me figure out why. And again, just to clarify, I'm not saying that Kyra should have waited been miserable over what happened with Satoru. That's even worse. What I am saying is that this entire situation with Satoru being put into a coma shouldn't have happened in the first place. This is what I meant when I said the coma was a bad decision. Yes, it was supposed to be a sad thing, but it also did irreversible damage to the story as a whole. One could say that it was necessary, because it plays into the theme of self-sacrifice, which would be consistent with what it showed us at the start. Satoru ending up in the hospital after saving that kid could be seen as foreshadowing to this. But first, Foreshadowing on its own isn't enough to justify a bad decision. All it does is hint towards that decision and show that it was planned, but it only improves things if it's already good in the first place, otherwise it doesn't really do anything. And second, Satoru never actually chose to sacrifice himself. This was forced upon him. You could argue that the mere fact that he is trying to save his mom and Kaio in itself is a choice and the coma is a direct consequence of that. But the two situations happen independently from one another and the plot didn't really give him any other choice. Satoru was sent back by a mysterious ability he had no control over and he can either try to save everyone from dying or just... I don't know, sit around, I guess? That's not a very compelling option. This isn't exactly a hard choice. And most of the time, Satoru's not even aware that there's gonna be a consequence. He just does it, and then the bad thing happens to him afterwards. If Satoru was, however, fully aware of exactly what the direct consequences were going to be, and had to actively choose between two very difficult options, that would actually make things a lot more compelling. Choices allow you to explore who a character truly is and gives them emotional depth, and can many times create really powerful moments. This is exactly what Steinsgate did, and it's beautiful. When you give a character a clear choice between two options, and each option has them losing something extremely important to them as a result, you've created an interesting dilemma. And if that very dilemma is the main point of the story, then the consequence would become impactful instead of disappointing. If this was what Arrays did, it would have changed these moments from a random bad thing happening to him completely out of his control to an active and compelling character moment that has substance. If it did this, as well as actually portraying these scenes as sad ones, then instead of being angry at the show, I probably would have loved it. I mean, I'd hate it too, obviously, but in a good way. Because now, instead of tossing away all of that development that we cared so much about, it instead uses that development to serve a real purpose. Even if it's not exactly what I want it to be, I can still accept it because I understand what the point of it all was. However, this is all assuming we take the entire self-sacrifice route in the first place. Because while this can still somewhat work, 
I actually think doing the opposite would be much better. Because another theme that's also prominent in Erased is Satoru opening up to value his friends and letting them become his true allies. Near the beginning, it's established that Satoru has a mindset of helping other people no matter the cost of what happens to him. It could have been that Satoru went from this to realizing that other people also value him as much as he does them that he can rely on those people to help him and that sacrifice isn't always necessary. These two themes would go hand in hand really well, and I know this would work because the show itself almost seemed to go in that direction. In this scene, when they're all sitting in the abandoned bus and are talking about what they're going to do next, Satoru has a straightforward plan that requires only him to bear the weight of the aftermath, but then... <laughs> Having an ending where Satoru doesn't have to lose anything would work because of this idea. One where Satoru goes from doing everything himself and bearing the weight of the consequences to learning to let the people around him become his allies and getting a win-win ending. And plus, it also challenges the trope of the self-sacrificing protagonist getting a bittersweet ending. Why can't you have both? Why can't you get a real happy ending without there being some sort of huge loss in order to get there? It'd be a great subversion from what you'd expect from a show like Erased, especially if the entire point of him going back was to do everything differently and change everyone's future for the better. That should include himself! This would also change the negative outcomes he had to go through at the beginning from a sign of foreshadowing into a sign of character development, since as he relies on his friends more, he doesn't need to bear the weight of these negative consequences on his own. And sure, you could say all this is just wish fulfillment on my part and I just want to see the characters be happy, but I honestly believe this ending could work really well. Like, if Raised had a happy ending that completely contradicted what the show was all about, I wouldn't want it. But I genuinely think that in this case, a happy ending would be beneficial to what the show was all about. And if that's not possible, at the very least execute the bittersweet parts in a way that actually feels justified. But ripping people's hearts out and stomping on them with stupid reasons to do so isn't a smart move, no matter how you look at it. And I think that kind of leads to my main flaw of the ending of Erased, as a whole. Because I feel like the majority of the problems I've had with these last few episodes aren't necessarily just coming from the actual things themselves happening, but more so that there's seemingly no good reasons for these decisions. Going back to what I was saying before about Steins Gate, our main character Okabe also loses a lot, and it's painful to watch. But not once did I ever think that was a detriment to the show as a whole. If anything, it was the very thing that made the show good. So what's the difference? It's purpose. All the decisions within Steins Gate were strongly motivated and had clear reasons for how it contributed to the story as a whole. Of course I was sad when certain things were lost, because that's how I was supposed to feel, that's what the show was trying to do, that was the point. But you'll notice that in a lot of the scenes I've brought up, Erased has this weird disconnect between how they're trying to make me feel and what's actually happening. They tried to make me feel sympathy for Kairo's mom, but it didn't work. They tried to make me feel joy when we saw Kairo again, but it didn't work. They tried to make me feel threatened by Yashiro, and they tried to make me feel satisfied with the implication that Satoru and Airi end up together, but it didn't work. It's like the show was trying to do everything it could to make me feel a certain way, but at the same time would constantly sabotage itself in a way where I'd feel the exact opposite. Where they're trying to do something now, but everything that was set up beforehand doesn't match up with it. It's weird. Not to make things clear, I'm not particularly mad at the writer or writers for this, since I'm sure there is some sort of reasonable explanation for why all this happened, but regardless whether or not you like the ending, the amount of disappointment it caused is still undeniable. And while each of the things I talked about individually wouldn't be as bad if they were the only problem, I believe the fact that they're combined is what truly caused most of the damage. So yeah, it's a lot more than just, oh, I'm salty about my OTP not coming true. Now I can sit here and complain all day long, and I just did, but in the end, it's gonna not, it's not gonna change anything. I need to do something constructive. So instead, I'm gonna ask the question, if I had the power to go back and change things, what would I do? How would I rewrite Erased from the very beginning? But first, before I get into that, I gotta make a quick interruption. I need your guys' help. You see, everyone on the Discord server has been bullying me. I've recently started streaming, which you should definitely check out if you ever have the time, and everyone just won't shut up about this stupid bread-eating stream they all want me to do for some reason. And so, I've decided to humor them. We're gonna be hitting 50k subs very soon, so I promise that when that happens, I will do a bread-eating stream. But you know, I'm pretty forgetful, so until that day, I want you to spam bread-eating stream when in the comments so I don't forget. When the time comes, I'll announce when I'm gonna do it on Twitter, so you're gonna have to follow me there to not miss it. Or at the very least, hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so that YouTube actually notifies you when I go live. To make things super helpful, I'll leave the links to everything, both in the description and the pinned comment below. I'll see you guys then.
Anyways, back to arrays now. Part six, what would I change? Well, I do think the majority of arrays good, I'm still going to have to make a few changes to the earlier stuff in order for this ending to work. And I'd start with the other kids. As interesting as Kyo's story was, the other kids were basically ignored for most of it and were just kind of given the bare minimum as their resolution. You could cut them out and just focus on Kyo completely, which would probably be easier to do and build a much stronger emotional connection with the storyline, but if you really had to keep them in, this is how I do it. First, give them proper introductions way earlier. The first time we actually saw Hiromi in person, I didn't even realize he was one of the victims until it was pointed out way later. And even then, he barely left an impression. I give both these kids strong, proper introductions that leave a lasting impression on us the same way I did with Kyo. They still don't need to have as much focus on them as we did with Kyo, but at the very least, give us something to care about. Who really are these kids? What do they want? What's their home life like? What are the problems they all have in common that caused them to be targeted in the first place? Explore these things a little. The plot here will go largely the same way as usual with Kyo, but there's a point in the story that I think would be the best time to conclude the other two kids' stories, and that's when Kyo is in hiding. Since Kyo is mostly just waiting at this point, it's the perfect opportunity to use this time to resolve everything else. Save the final confrontation in Kyo's story till the end. You want to save the thing that we emotionally care about the most to be as close to the end as possible. End it on a high note. But until then, the other two kids should have had some form of small plot developments too peppered throughout. And when Kyo goes into hiding, this is our chance to fully confront these stories and get them resolved. Now, I don't know the exact details of what or how this would happen, but that's largely up to the writer. They already proved they can do this sort of thing with Kyo, so they could do something similar with these kids if we just spent a little bit more focus on them. It doesn't need to be big, in fact, keep it as simple and quick as possible so that things don't get too cluttered. Even if it was done basically the same way to how things happened in the actual show, that's fine. The point here is that the order it all happens in is rearranged. Now we might have to extend Kyo's stay at the bus for just a little bit, but it shouldn't make too much of a difference. And once this part is over, we can return to her story and continue as normal again. Kyo would stay at Satoru's house, we get the breakfast scene as usual, the other kids are safe, everything's looking good, and this is the calm before the storm, the point before things start to build up to the climax, or more specifically, the confrontation with the killer. Much like what's happened in the show, the killer has had his plans forwarded time and time again, and he's growing frustrated. So now, he needs to put a plan into action. A real, solid plan. And this is where Masato comes in. She becomes the main target for the killer. And like how I mentioned before, it slipped past Satoru how she was isolated from everyone else as a result of the lunch money scene. Just because she wasn't one of the victims in the original timeline, it doesn't mean she can't become one. But this time, the killer has also gone about things differently. Because this time, he has a plan to lure out Satoru and lead Misato to her death at the same time. And it goes off perfectly. This is all set up in a way where we as the audience don't know this is happening until the reveal. All at once, we realize that Yashiro is the killer and that Misato's life is at stake. He has manipulated her mental state for a long time now and now that's being paid off here where she's now about to jump off a bridge. Until now, it's been very ambiguous with what's been happening with her, and it could reveal a totally different side to her that we never anticipated, but makes sense when you put everything together. We can also foreshadow this earlier on in the series where we see her innocently sitting at the bridge, saying it's her comfort spot and that the height doesn't scare her, which would take on a whole new meaning once we realize what's going on. And the final nail in the coffin is that Yashiro had been manipulating her carefully so that nobody suspects anything and she thinks she came to this decision on her own. Now Satoru is trapped in the car with Yashiro and is powerless to do anything. Again, this part is similar to what happens in the anime, except this time there's the added stakes of Masato's life being on the line, and we're running out of time. We also learn here of Yashiro's main reason for why he's killing children, and that's that he does it for sport. We could learn how he started with killing animals as a child, and his fascination grew deeper as time went on. And now, he does it for the thrill of trying to see how many murders he can get away with without leaving a single trace before moving on to the next location and doing it all again. Throughout this, I also think he shouldn't do the evil smile Thing. Having him act in the same way he always did, in a calm, playful manner, while saying all this disturbing stuff would make it even more bone chilling. Yashiro then concludes that Satoru predicting his every move was just by mere chance, since he's just a child. They get to the lake, Yashiro forcefully locks the doors from the outside, drives the car into the water, and Satoru tries to escape but can't. Yashiro then walks off and then takes another car to get to Misato. The car slowly fills up with water, and Satoru struggles to escape. But right as all seems lost, he hears a thump on the window, looks to his right, and it's Yuki. Yuki smashes his foot through the window, grabs Satoru and swims up to the land saving him. It turns out that same lake was the very place Yuki would always hang around at, and it's thanks to the fact that Yuki would always be at these places, even if people judged him, that he was able to find and save Satoru. Satoru explains the situation, and they call Satoru's mom and the police, and rush to get to Misato. Now it's going to be a super intense situation of everyone trying to get there in time. But while I don't know the exact details of how this would go down, I think it should really be Kenya who saves Misato in this situation. He would have seen before what was happening and decided 
decided to follow and got to her first. What's important here though is that Kenya doesn't just save her physically, but also mentally, and truly lives up to his promise to become a hero like Satoru. Yashiro would see this and get frustrated and is about to go up to them to finish the job himself, but then Satoru's mom arrives. There's tense silence at first, everyone is standing out in the middle of the bridge. Which is when we tilt down and reveal that attached to the support beams below, there's a bomb, and Yashiro has the detonator. It was there as a last resort, since he'd have preferred to handle things discreetly, but now, not only is he standing on the bridge, but so is Kenya, Misato, and Satoru's mum. If they go down, he goes down with them. Yashiro asks Satoru's mum what brought her there, and she simply says she went out for a nice walk. But Yashiro isn't stupid. Somehow she knows what the situation is and is stalling for time. He must have slipped up somehow. But he stays calm. The police are probably on their way, so he was gonna have to think quickly. We cut to Satoru and Yuki trying to get there as fast as possible, then we cut back. Satoru's mom then questions Yashiro, and he plays dumb, pretending he was there because he was concerned about Misato. She questions him further, but he responds calmly, coming up with plausible excuses on the spot. He then tries to take away Misato, acting as if he's gonna take her home safely, but Kenya asks to stay with her, which complicates things. Satoru's mom continues stalling him, refusing to let him leave, but Yashiro knows what she's doing. He quickly steers the conversation in the way he wants it to go, and is about to successfully take Misato away, until we hear Satoru and Yuki arrive. Instantly, Yashiro switches and grabs Misato so she can't escape, holding out the detonator in front of him for everyone to see. He tells them about the bomb, and that if any one of them come closer, he's gonna blow up the bridge. Everyone's frozen in place. And after a tense silence, Yashiro then asks Satoru if he remembered about the story with the sinner and the spider's web. This time, instead of it being his motivation, it could just be a smaller thing, something he briefly mentioned in a class in a previous episode, but we never heard fully until now. We hear sirens and see the police coming closer and closer. Everyone tries to convince Yashiro to let Misato go and stop this, but Yashiro ignores them and starts telling the story. It doesn't make any sense to us, why is he saying this all now? And as the police pull up, everyone screams at Yashiro as he finishes his story, he looks at them and says, I am that sinner. He presses the button, and there's an explosion. Everything goes in slow motion as the bridge is slowly engulfed in flames, and Satoru thinks that it's all over, that there's nothing he could do. But then, out of the corner of his eye, he sees a blue butterfly. Boom! Satoru is back in Yashiro's car as he's explaining everything to him, and Satoru is in shock. Yep, revival activated within a revival. Is it a little ridiculous? Maybe, but it's not like there were any hard rules for this, and I think it's a cool concept anyway, so that's what I'm gonna do. Satoru has to think fast. He has one more chance to change things, so he needs to get it right. The same thing happens where Yashiro locks him in the car and drives it into the lake. Satoru is saved by Yuki, and this time, after calling his mom and the police, he calls his friends and tells them about the bomb. Maybe they're all in the hideout nearby or something, and they have a phone there, I don't know. Do whatever it takes to make sense. What's important is that Hiromi could be the one to answer the phone and explain to everybody, and Aya should be with them. Then, we do the entire sequence again, but from a completely different perspective, where the kids are down underneath the bridge desperately trying to find and hack off the bomb, while above them Satoru's mom tries to stall Yashiro. And because we already know when Yashiro detonates the bomb, as the conversation gets closer and closer to that point, it becomes nail-bitingly tense. Satoru and Yuki shows up, which immediately sends things into panic mode. Stuff could go wrong, and they need to figure something out last second, and right as Yashiro is finishing his story once again, the kids just manage to hack off the bomb, and Yashiro detonates it right as it hits the water. It explodes, water rains down, Yashiro is in shock. He runs over to the edge of the bridge and sees the kids and falls to his knees in defeat, laughing to himself. The police run up to arrest him and the kids join everyone else at the bridge. And while they, along with Satoru, are scolded for being reckless since it was a very dangerous situation, in the end they're also acknowledged for their bravery. Everyone is now safe, Yashiro is taken away, and the main conflict is resolved. We go back to the house and Satoru's mom takes care of Satoru after you know, almost dying, and they can also talk a bit about what happened with Kaio. At this point, Kaio has been staying at their house for a little longer than last time, but not by much. After this, we could maybe get a nice moment with him and Kaio where they talk to each other and they go to sleep. Next morning, next episode, we get to the final confrontation with Kaio's mom. The scene's gonna go pretty similarly to how it happened originally, but with one key difference. Cut the scene where Kaio's mom throws a temper tantrum and breaks stuff. This time, when she opens the door, she's cold and quiet. Keep in mind that at this point, Kaio has been gone for even longer than the original, so this would be even more unusual. However, as a subtle background detail, we can still see destruction behind her in the house. I also want to go back a few episodes to the scene where she dumps Kaio's belongings in the trash, where originally she had a comically evil smile, in this version we don't see her expression. The camera only shows her back as she stands there motionless. 
This in itself would add a ton of nuance to this character without saying a word. We're also going to have to do the same sort of thing with a bunch of other scenes where she acts over the top, making it so that she instead behaves in a more grounded and real way, at least in order for this scene to work. Back to this scene, Kairu's mom is angry, but quiet. And then the scene continues in the same general way it did originally, but this time we change some of the dialogue with the added context of them having caught Yashiro, but it still goes in the same direction. And Kairu's mom retains this cold tone of voice. She grabs Kairu, is about to go to the police, and then her relative shows up. Not the grandmother's time, perhaps like a sister or something, this will make sense in a minute. Now from what we know about Kairu's mom, we can tell that she's a violent person. Whenever she feels threatened, whenever she feels put under pressure, her first instinct is to lash out violently. Which is why in the original scene, it kind of felt off that she'd just lay herself bare in front of everyone like that and expose her vulnerabilities. It's not completely out of the question, but it does very much come out of nowhere. This time, we're gonna get everything we already know about her and change the meaning of it. So. What I'm gonna do here in the scene is when Kyra's mom sees this new person, it sets her off. The context here is that the relative knew Kyra's mom was being abused, but instead of doing anything to help her, she abandoned her and left her to fend for herself. And now she's come back to take Kyra away. None of this is explicitly told to us, but it's subtly interwoven into the dialogue as Kyra's mom starts questioning her, then screaming at her, telling her she's not taking Kyra away, which after a lot of back and forth escalates into her attacking her, mindlessly throwing punch after punch. We could also flash a few shots of her in the past being abused just for a split second, which would work as a mirror image of what's happening now. And and then, after all that, when the music peaks, she finally breaks down and cries. The music turns solemn, everyone is silent, and the camera slowly moves backwards and fades. It cuts to her being put into a police car and they shut the door. Satoru asks what's gonna happen to her and the officer says nonchalantly that she's going to jail for child abuse. And I think this would conflict us, because it makes sense and is giving us exactly what we thought we wanted, but suddenly we question if that's even what we want anymore. After this we move on and we focus on Kayo again, and the scene continues as it did originally. Kayo and Satoru talk, she thanks him and smiles, and she's taken away to stay with her grandma. We get the scene where they slowly drive away, Satoru chases after them, and Kayo recites the poem, except this time, because the show is almost over, it really has that sense of finality and bitter sweetness to it. We watch them turn the corner and disappear, Satoru stands there and we breathe for a moment, really letting the moment settle. We did it. And then a blue butterfly appears and lands in front of him. It stays for a moment, then fades away. In a flash, Revival activates and Satoru's new memories flash by. His life goes in the same general direction as it did at the beginning, but this time there are a few key differences. And when we arrive back at the present, we can learn a lot of this stuff back to the future style. Like have Satoru discover his mom's still okay, how his friends are doing now that they're all grown up, how Yuki has a family, and all the other changes from how it was in the first episode. Basically just showing how he made a difference in all those areas and concluding everyone's stories. Same as before, Satoru talks to his manga editor and this time he loves it. And finally, to finish things off, Satoru is in his office and hears a knock on the door. He answers it, and there, standing at the entrance, is Kyo. And she's happy. She greets him, smiles warmly, and we cut to the credits, which would then lead to showing a montage of everyone's daily lives now that everything's over, similar to the original. In this version, it's mostly just gonna allude to them getting together rather than actually showing it, similar to A Silent Voice or Your Name, since the romance isn't really meant to be the point of this, it's to show that Kaya's living happily now. And I think seeing her like this again for the first time in years would be a really heartwarming moment, and would more effectively get across what the original scene was trying to do. So yeah, that's how I'd rewrite the ending of Erased, let me know what you think, was it a substantial improvement or did you think it also didn't work? I didn't make any of this to disrespect the original writers or actors if my version was better or anything, I mostly just did it so I could gain closure on this series and hopefully be able to share that with you guys. I know I went the entire video basically just rambling on about why I didn't like these last few episodes, but I still want to reiterate that Raised As Is isn't absolute trash. I had a lot to say about it, but any kind of genuine anger or disappointment I had towards it faded a long time ago. I just thought it was an interesting topic to dissect and learn about and sometimes poke fun at a little. Heck, most people I've talked to actually thought the ending was overhated. Like, seriously, everyone would say that it wasn't that bad. Which makes writing this feel kind of pointless. But if you're a writer and this video discouraged you in any way, worry not. Since despite all the problems I talked about, there are still plenty of people who thought the ending was good, even if I fundamentally disagree. To me, it's like the show put on a spectacular performance, but twisted its ankle right as it landed. It could have been a lot worse, but you can see how everything before it is less good because of it. And I just know that if it had an ending, even if it's not mine, that was just as good as the rest of the series was? It could have been a masterpiece. It was this close. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Brandon Riley, 
and I can't wait to watch Darling in the Franks. I, Brandon, was wrong! Smash to run in darkness and pause on Megumi. I'll do better. Kazuya from Rent a Girlfriend is a superb main character, and I, Brandon, relate to him. I don't have anything profound to say. Megumin is trash compared to Darkness, and frankly, even Aqua is better than her. Ugh, now I gotta wash my mouth thanks to all that trash taste. Ugh.